There's a common perception that democracy ends with a battle, soldiers in the streets, a coup d'etat, the fall of a government. But we know that democracy can be lost one little step at a time. We've reported on it and lived through it. And when we look at America today, right now, we see a place where the slide to autocracy has already begun. It's not some distant future, it's the present. I'm Anne Applebaum, a staff writer at The Atlantic. I'm Peter Pomerantsev, a senior fellow at the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. We're the hosts of a new podcast from The Atlantic, Autocracy in America. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Would you give up your kidney for $50,000? Selling body parts isn't the sort of feel-good policy we usually get into here at Good on Paper, but here we are. I'm bringing this up for good reason. In 2022, about 12 people in need of a kidney transplant died every day. And currently, more than 90,000 Americans are waiting for a kidney transplant. Dialysis, the runner-up treatment for kidney failure, is a poor substitute for a transplant. You're more likely to die or experience what's called a cardiovascular event, not to mention the various quality of life issues that come with having to go to the hospital or another treatment center all the time to get your blood processed. But there are simply not enough kidneys to go around. Even though most of us have one to spare, kidney donation is uncommon, and it's easy to understand why. It requires months of planning and medical testing, a painful surgery and recovery. It's a lot. Well, in 2016, my friend Dylan Matthews, a reporter for Vox, became one of 5,633 people in the United States to donate a kidney that year. But unlike the vast majority of those people, Dylan didn't do this for a family member or a friend. He's one of a small set of people who donated his kidney in a non-directed way to a stranger. And while he didn't get paid, he's recently written about a bill to make the U.S. one of the first countries in the world to pay kidney donors for their efforts, $50,000. This is Good on Paper, a policy show that questions what we really know about popular narratives. I'm your host, Jerusalem Demsis, and today we're going to talk about whether markets and organ donation are a good idea. Many people, and particularly those who work in the field of bioethics, are apprehensive about the idea of commercializing organ donation. There's fear of denigrating the human body, of coercing low-income people into taking on a dangerous surgery, and of undermining altruistic donation. I've invited Dylan on the show to talk about this idea and about why paying people for their kidneys might be less controversial than it sounds. Dylan, welcome to the show. It's so good to be here. Uh, So we're here because you have donated your kidney and proved that you are better than me, who has not donated my kidney. Um, And you're here to convince me why I should also donate my kidney. Is that is that correct? That is that is one read on what we're doing here. (laughs) Uh, I'm happy to try to give you my best sell. I did donate my kidney eight years ago. I've been dining out on it ever since. Uh, But I'm I'm a big, big evangelist for it uh, and think it is more attainable than most people think it is. So I want to start with trying to understand why kidney donation is so, like, central to this conversation about organ needs in the United States and in the world generally. So, like, what are the stakes here? Like, why are kidneys in such high demand? Sure. So, um, for... I don't know metaphysically why this is the case, but most organs that people need are kidneys. So if you go through the waiting list that's uh, sort of administered nationally in the U.S., um, there's about, I think, uh, 106,000 people on the list total. Of those, 84% just need a kidney. Some people need a kidney and something else. Um, I think the second biggest category is liver. There's part, lungs, whatever. But like 84% is a pretty overwhelming majority. Um, the, the big, big share of people who are waiting for an organ are waiting for a kidney. Um, there are a bunch of things that can lead to uh, what, what's technically called end-stage renal disease, more colloquially it's just called liv- uh, kidney failure. You can have sort of polycystic kidney disease, which is a genetic condition that sort of manifests at some point. Um, it's a complication from diabetes as you get older. Mm-hmm. There's just a lot of uh, different factors that all put stress on your kidneys and can lead both of them to to fail at some point in your life. And the 
best possible treatment for that is to get a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. So one way this manifests is that if you're waiting for an organ, you're going to wait longer for a kidney. That I think, depending on how healthy you are in your condition, um, it is not uncommon to wait over three years. If you go through people who get uh, transplants uh, for kidneys, I think about a quarter of them waited three or more years for it. Most of them wait longer than a year. For every other organ, the reverse is true. A majority of people get an organ within a year, and there's generally sufficient supply. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't mean to say there are no problems. There's there's definitely issues with donation for, for heart and lung and, and things that could go better. But the demand is overwhelmingly in the kidney side of things. I mean, this is something you um, told me earlier, but less than 1% of all deaths are eligible for kidney donation. Is there something about the kidneys that makes it harder to retrieve them at death? So that's a that's a step for sort of organ donation generally. Okay. Um, and I think this is like something that I've, I, I did not know before donating and that I think when I talk to most people about this, people don't realize that, yeah, that to get your organs from a deceased donor to a point where they can be transplanted, mm-hmm. like a lot of things have to be true. So in the U.S., generally organs for people who die when they're 75 or older are not transplanted because of sort of presumed medical problems. Uh, you have to die in a hospital. Most people don't die in a hospital. A lot mm-hmm. of people die in nursing homes or at home. Uh, you have to be uh, sort of on a ventilator. Uh, you have to not have certain like contraindications like multiple organ failure mm-hmm. or we can now transplant from people who are HIV positive, but like that's not people's first choice. Yeah. Um, so there's all these contraindications, and there have been a bunch of studies sort of going through all deaths in the U.S. and like trying to narrow down by each of these selection criteria. And once you funnel it down like that, you get to um, I think it's 0.96 percent of of all deaths uh, typically are of a kind where you can donate. And I think about half of those are uh, sort of brain deaths, uh, mm-hmm. people who are still breathing but but don't have brain functioning, and about half are, are cardiac deaths. And so people's hearts aren't beating, they aren't breathing. Mm-hmm. And so you donated your kidney in August of 2016. I wonder, I mean, when I think about kidney donation, I think about, you know, it's, it seems like a very intense surgery. Mm-hmm. And can you talk to us if you had any doubts when you were deciding to do this? I had been thinking about doing it for maybe five or six years by the time I actually did it. Mm-hmm. So I think my my doubts were were close to gone. I had done a lot of research into it. I had had friends who'd done it. You and I have a mutual friend, Alexander Berger, mm-hmm. who uh, I had talked to about about doing it. I had a friend, uh, another friend in D.C. who had done it. And so from talking about their experiences, they didn't like sugarcoat it. They're like, it's hard and it's painful. Mm-hmm. And the first week afterwards is going to suck. But like, you will get over it. <laughs> and um, and um, I met both of them sort of well after they had donated and could see that they had no sort of chronic health problems and were, were doing perfectly fine. So I was a little nervous about it. And, and I think I really do not like being a burden to people. Mm-hmm. And so I think the thing I was most nervous about was that like my now wife, then girlfriend was like taking time off work to help me. And my dad was flying down and like I, I felt nervous about imposing on them. Mm-hmm. But um I'd read the studies, and I knew this was a safe procedure, and so I, I felt pretty good going into it. Well, let, let's dive into, like, how safe it is, right? Mm-hmm. So you've talked about some of the risks of the procedure. Obviously, some of them are just, like, the pain. Any kind of intensive surgery comes with some associated risks. What do we know about the risk of donating your kidney on your own health? Sure. So I think uh, I would split it into sort of a- acute risks and chronic risks, mm-hmm. sort of more short-term or long-term. Uh, so the short-term risk, um, anytime you get put under for major surgery, um, there's a chance something goes wrong and and there's a, a non-zero risk of death. Mm-hmm. For kidney donation in the U.S., there was a, a new study just sort of crunching the numbers on this. The risk is now under 1 in 10,000. Um, so for context, that's like the homicide rate in a really safe city. <laughs> um, and... Uh, well below rates of mor- mortality and childbirth, which are too high. There's mm-hmm. one thing to take away from that, but um, it's well within sort of the scope of, of risks that people take on for medical procedures. And it's been going down pretty rapidly. Like when I got my surgery, the number that they quoted me was three in 10,000 rather than one in 10,000. So the 
we've been getting better at this. The surgery has been getting safer. The surgery has been getting less invasive. Mm -hmm. It used to be, uh, so my my uncle donated a kidney in the 80s, Mm -hmm. and they fully cut open his abdomen, and he has a scar going up across, like, his entire belly. I had a laparoscopic surgery, which is when they, like, make small incisions Mm -hmm. and put a camera in and, like, do it with very fine instruments. Um, And so, like, my recovery was a lot easier than his, and it was a lot less invasive and risky uh, because they were just, like, cutting you open to a much lesser degree. Mm -hmm. So that's the short-term stuff. Uh, Long-term, the last numbers I saw on this is that you you do have a significantly elevated risk of getting kidney failure yourself. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) so uh, I think in the, the overall... American population, about 3% of people will have kidney failure at some point in their lives. Among kidney donors, it's about 1%. Mm -hmm. And that first glance, that looks like, actually, you have a lower risk. But kidney donors are a very weirdly selected group. You are healthier overall than most of the general population. And so if you do a matched comparison to people who are similarly healthy but didn't donate, they have a lifetime risk of like a third of a percent. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, your risk goes up three times. That's not nothing. On the other hand, it goes up to 1%, and mm-hmm. you have a 99% chance of this not being an issue for you at all. And also, uh, there is something called the, the voucher program that the National Kidney Registry runs, which gives you advantage in getting a kidney for yourself should you need one later because you donated. Mm-hmm. Um, so taking all that into account, I thought, like, the main thing I was worried about were the longer-term risks. I decided I could live with them, especially if I, I got expedited access to a transplant if I needed it. And... Um, and I think that's still true, and I think it's it's also true that the risks are getting lower as mm-hmm. uh, as time goes on and medicine improves. Yeah, and I think you've actually overstated the risk to healthy people here, right? Like you said that the lifetime risk was about a third of a percent. Um, the Ki- National Kidney Registry cites a 2015 study um, showing the lifetime risk of kidney failure for a donor is a little under a percent, um, like you said, but for a healthy non-donor, it's only about a seventh of a percent. Um, so you know, there's obviously a difference there, but it is very, very small. It's even smaller than you thought. Um, uh, but, but it's important to note that, you know, this is a very selected group of people that's being studied when we're looking at, um, you know, health outcomes for uh, kidney donors. When you say, you know, you don't see a lot of death, you don't see a lot of mortality risk, uh, that's when we're keeping it contained to the few thousand people who are opting in and passing all of these screenings to make sure you're really healthy and aren't taking on significant risks. And, you know, anyone who has, you know, real fears about their health is either going to self-select out or going to be weeded out in that system. And it's like an onerous testing process. I think I went through like six months of like blood tests. Um, there was a day where I had to collect everything I peed for the day. They gave <laughs> wow. me like a jug. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I had to okay. like, I got drinks with a friend and I was like, can I walk from my apartment in DuPont Circle to Logan Circle, have drinks with a friend and go back in time to collect the inevitable pee from getting drinks with my friend? <laughs> did you make I it? Did. I I made it. Wow. I made it. We're all proud. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, and and so, yeah, that weeds out a lot of people. Um, so, but are, is the, is the like, onerous testing for your benefit or to make sure the kidney that you eventually donate does not mess up the other person who's getting the kidney? Like, what's the... I think it, it, it's a mix of the two. So one is they, they want to make sure that you're not, especially if you were, like me, a non-directed donor, so mm-hmm. you weren't directed, like, donating to a family member or something. They wanted to be sure that you didn't have any counterindications that meant that losing a kidney would probably be, like, especially bad for you. Mm -hmm. Um, If you had existing kidney damage, if your kidneys were not sort of filtering blood the way they should be already. Mm -hmm. Um, So some of it was that. But then some of it was um, there are these certain antigens that the human body uses that are sort of particular to people to tell sort of what is your body from what is not your body. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There are these little proteins around our cells and I don't know that they're absolutely unique like snowflakes, but they're used by the immune system to say, like, this is part of Dylan. This mm-hmm. is not part of Dylan. And if if your antigens are something that your recipient has built up antibodies to, which can happen through, like, mm-hmm. viral infections and all it'll kinds of reasons. It'll reject the kidney. It'll know? reject the kidney. Yeah. And it'll be really, really bad. And so a lot of it is, like, collecting that information and making sure that when they do a match, um, there isn't a conflict like that. 
So, I mean, just to put a couple numbers on the board for what you were talking about, the National Kidney Foundation says the typical wait for a kidney donor in 2015 was 145 days. And that sounds like a long time until you hear that the number for other people was over 1,600 days. Yep. Um, it's possible that you might have to be on dialysis anyway, but it does seem that like it, it is a very strong benefit in your favor if you ever do need a kidney. Um, but, you know, obviously neither of us are our doctors. Uh, uh, <laughs> people should talk to their doctors yes. if they're interested in doing this. But it seems like there's also like a lot of heterogeneous effects based on like subpopulations too. Um, it's interesting. It seems like it's worse for men on average, but the risks to women who will become pregnant are also um, uh, significant. So uh, yes, yeah. this is the. I'm glad you brought that up since that is that is sort of like the third category of risk that um, that I didn't mention in part because it was not relevant for me. Mm -hmm. But there's immediate surgical mortality. There's kidney failure later in life. And among women who've donated kidneys and then gone on to become pregnant and give birth, the rate of preeclampsia, um, so sort of hypertension, mm -hmm. high blood sugar when you're, or high blood pressure. pressure yeah. yeah. Uh, again, we're not doctors. <laughs> <laughs> high, high blood pressure while pregnant um, is higher if you've, you've previously donated. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of uh, women who sort of wait until they're done having kids to, to donate or at the very least are cognizant of that as a, as a potential risk factor. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's The other hard thing is that if you donate afterwards, like one of the things you're not supposed to do is lift heavy objects. So if you have like a toddler, mm -hmm. that's a really mm -hmm. hard rule. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I think it's definitely like trickier for people with uteruses than, than people without. But even there, like it's it's a risk among others. Mm -hmm. I know women who've looked at that and thought, you know, I'm, I still think this is a good thing to do um, mm -hmm. and I'm willing to, to take the risk. So something you wrote one time was, um, and I don't have the quote in front of you, so I'm going to just paraphrase sure. it. But you wrote that, you know, everyone involved in your kidney donation got paid except for you. The doctor got paid, the nurses got paid, the lab techs got paid, uh, but you, the donor, <laughs> was asked to do it just out of the goodness of your heart. So can you help us understand the kind of the out-of-pocket expenses that, that went into this for you? Sure. Um, and, and I should say that my recipient did not get paid, but they did get a kidney. Yeah. Um, so they, <laughs> they, they got something of, of significant value. So my donation for me was cheaper than usual uh, in that I was working then as now at Vox Media. Uh, Vox gave me medical leave for this. And so I didn't lose wages. Mm. A lot of people who donate who are working sort of hourly or, or don't have uh, paid vacation, taking time off work, lost wages is a very significant expense. Mm -hmm. There were some transit costs just because I donated in Baltimore and I live in D.C. And so, like, I didn't want to deal with the uh, train home. And so I got an Uber and that was expensive. Mm -hmm. The bigger thing was lodging and transit for family members mm -hmm. that uh, you don't really want to be in a hospital for a week alone. Yeah. Um, and my dad flew down from New Hampshire and, and uh, stayed in a hotel. Hannah got a hotel room as well. Hannah, that, your partner. My partner, yeah. yeah. So I think those are, are all very significant things. And then if you're thinking about things that disincentivize people to donate, mm -hmm. there are those like literal costs that will like show up on your personal budget. And then economists often like to think about the dollar value of health risks. Mm -hmm. So like what is the amount that you have to pay someone to go be a logger, mm -hmm. knowing that being a logger is dangerous? And so I think there are some real disincentives just in knowing that there are significant health risks in that. And depending on how you evaluate that, that can be thousands to tens of thousands of dollars worth of uh, risks that you're undertaking. Mm -hmm. And so people who've tried to like quantify the total amount of disincentives get a number of around like forty or fifty thousand uh, mm -hmm. dollars per donation. Um, and that's to make you whole. That's not to actually right. that's pay not you with to, extra. To go above and actively incentivize. And there are some tools to deal with this. There's something called the, the National Living Donor um, Advocacy Center, mm -hmm. uh, NLDAC. And they will reimburse some things like lost wages and travel expenses. But currently, they have this bizarre policy where it's limited based on the income of the recipient. Mm -hmm. So if you're a donor and you are not rich, but you are donating to a random person and that person turns out to have a lot of money, like you don't get reimbursed, mm -hmm. uh, which makes no sense. And there's currently a good bill in Congress to try to fix this. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, all of which is to say, like, you cannot reliably get reimbursed for these expenses if you're donating right now. So this is a very rare thing to do. Um, sure. In 2023, just 407 people donated a kidney to a stranger. So I guess the ob I guess before we get into the policies stuff that we want to talk about, like, why did you do this? Um, 
why did I do this? I heard that it was a thing you could do. I read a piece by Larissa McFarquhar in The New Yorker. I'm sorry to, to name an Atlantic competitor, but um, <laughs> she wrote a great piece called The Kindest Cut about people who've donated to strangers and, and sort of about people's aversion to them and thought, thinking this is sort of creepy or mm-hmm. like threatening. And I thought that was an interesting angle on it. Um, and so people I, thought it was creepy to donate your kidney? Yeah, I think in in that it, it she expresses this more artfully than I can, but that it seemed so extreme that there has to be a catch. Mm. That, like, it doesn't p- fit people's model of how the world works mm-hmm. that someone would just, like, give a kidney away. And so they must have, like, some nefarious motive for mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I read that piece and I thought, well, I don't think these people are creepy. Mm-hmm. And I think they, they did something pretty good. And I looked into it and saw that sort of getting a living donor kidney extends your life significantly more than a deceased donor kidney. Mm-hmm. There's a much better quality of life than if you're still on dialysis, which mm-hmm. typically leaves you homebound. It means you can't work. And Dialysis is a treatment for kidney failure if you don't get a kidney. Right, right. Yeah. It's You're hooked up to a machine that sort of filters your blood the way a, a kidney would, but it's takes a lot of time. It's very physically draining. It's, and it's not as effective. It's not as effective. Yeah. It's uh, sort of associated with significantly shorter life. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it seemed like there's a very small risk to me um, and a very significant benefit to someone else. So, like, why shouldn't I do it? All right. After the break, Dylan makes the case for getting paid for your kidney. I'm Hannah Rosen. And I'm Lauren Ober. And about a year ago, we met a new neighbor. She'd moved to our Washington, D.C. neighborhood to get justice for her daughter. Who was shot and killed at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Ashley Babbitt was absolutely murdered. When we found out who our neighbor was, we could have decided to give her the cold shoulder. After all, January 6th was an assault on our city. Or we could be neighborly. So that's what we did. Before we knew it, we'd fallen into this upside-down world where insurrectionists are heroes who might try to save our country a second time. Like, how long are you going to stay in D.C.? I plan to stay till like, January 7th. (laughs) And where our neighbor, kind of an icon. Look inside yourself and be your own hero. Stand up and We live here now, from the Atlantic. Follow wherever you get your podcasts. It's clear that the altruistic donation like yours is not going to come anywhere near meeting the demand, right? We're talking about a few hundred people a year making that sort of decision. Um, But you've come out in support of something that might help do this that sounds pretty controversial, which is that we should be able to pay people for their body parts. (laughs) Um, Or more specifically, that you should be able to pay people for donating their kidneys. This feels like it kind of flies in the face of common moral intuitions. Can you inhabit the position of someone who might find this icky and tell us why they would feel that way? Sure. So so you, we're starting off with, like, uh, me playing devil's advocate against the position that I hold? Is yes, that how we're doing exactly this? Yes, that's exactly how we're starting, okay. yeah. Um, <laughs> so to be clear about what the position is mm-hmm. out front, I'm not saying that people should be able to just buy each other's kidneys. <laughs> yeah. Um, the proposal, which is, is an actual bill called the End Kidney Deaths Act, would create a tax credit that is fully refundable of $10,000 a year for five years for people who donate. So it is not a transaction. It's not people buying kidneys from each other. Mm -hmm. It is compensation from the government for having donated. Um, So it's not a market in kidneys. No one's buying each other's kidneys. Rich Mm -hmm. people don't get access to kidneys before poor people. Mm -hmm. I just feel like that's very important to say up front. Um, I think if I'm inhabiting the position of someone who finds this icky you immediately get into a headspace of worrying that this will exploit poor people who are desperate and will will be more likely to donate their kidney um, Mm -hmm. if there's compensation and that they might not truly want to do this but are only doing this for money, and that's morally problematic. And I could also imagine a concern that there is an illicit trade in organs internationally, Mm -hmm. and will this weaken our ability to fight that? 
I want to be clear that I don't think either of these are good or like even particularly coherent arguments, but these are the common arguments that you you hear. But even before then, right, like there's a sense of and I mean, you can take it to a logical extreme of like we would not we we have senses around the um, dignity of like a human being and that we wouldn't allow, for instance, someone to sell themselves into slavery. We would find it a little bit concerning if someone was able to to buy a heart from someone else, even if they fully consented, even if that person was rich, even if it wasn't a poor person being exploited. Someone wants to sell their heart in order to, for whatever reason, we would just, we wouldn't yes. allow that kind of thing. We to do exist. have laws against murder. We yeah. do. No, but not even just murder. Like if you were to say willingly for whatever reason that you chose to do that and you were found competent. My point is like the yeah. reasons for like not allowing this often have to do with our senses of what sorts of things feel outside the bounds of moral reasonableness, and they're not often actually easily articulable. Like even I'm, I'm struggling to do this, and I've sure. read people who talk about this issue who are concerned about allowing for compensation for organ donation and kidney donation, and they often struggle to fully articulate this, but they do seem to be touching on something that many people, I think, find resonant, right? Which is that there's right. this concern that you shouldn't, this shouldn't be commercialized. That this, that this part of um, your body should not be something that can be marketed and given away for money. And I understand that you're supporting a very specific bill here, but do you find that to be at all something that resonates with you? No. Yeah. I mean, I I could lie and say that I I find it uh, it's, we're all part of life's rich tapestry and that I don't find this to be like metaphysical bullshit yeah. that people come up with when they don't actually have arguments for things. But no, I mean, what work is is that you are giving of your body to perform a service in return for compensation. Mm-hmm. And as you say, I think people have certain intuitions about um, the things should be outside the bounds of the market. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people feel like sex work should be outside the bounds of the market, mm-hmm. that, that performing sex acts on somebody should be given freely and not not with any compensation mm-hmm. and that it, it sort of is degrading to the act. Um, and I think there are a lot of actual sex workers who would say that that is incredibly insulting and uh, denies them sort of their personal autonomy. And I think this is a similar but higher stakes version of that in that It is extremely life and death. I think our decision to not allow any compensation for kidney donors has resulted in the deaths of conservatively hundreds of thousands, but probably millions of people since the 1980s when when kidney transplantation became sort of reliable and doable Mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. And so if you're going to be killing millions of people, I think you need a really good answer for why you're doing that. And it needs to be a better answer than it makes me feel icky this metaphor of buying kidneys, Mm -hmm. which again is just a metaphor. Like I prefer to think of it as paying donors for our work Mm -hmm. because it's work. You go into a hospital, you do something that is physically strenuous. You take time and effort out of your life uh, to save someone's life. And then you get nothing for it. Mm -hmm. Your surgeon gets something for it. Uh, Nurses get something for it. Everyone else And it it drives me particularly crazy when I hear transplant surgeons talk about how it sort of undermines the altruism Mm -hmm. of the gift to compensate it. You're making 200 grand a year Mm -hmm. and you're going to like lecture me about how it undermines the altruism to get paid like a few tens of thousands of dollars for saving someone's life. Like Mm -hmm. go to hell. Mm. Well, I mean, I don't want us to stick on the, I think, the weakest version of this argument because sure. even you are, are are saying that, like, this is not the one that you find anywhere near compelling. But the one that you find the most compelling is this idea about coercion. This is the one that kind of gets me. Um, and I guess before I even get into this, are you saying that you would not support a bill allowing for even the regulated sale of organs? No, I don't think peer-to-peer organ sales is, is a good idea. Sort of... Uh, Iran has a system sort of like that where donors get some compensation from the government of Iran Mm -hmm. um, for sort of, which is meant to be sort of reimbursing them for costs of donation. And then nonprofits will sort of broker deals between recipients and donors uh, as to sort of side payments. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if you like put a gun to my head and said like we can have the US system or we can have the Iran system we should absolutely have the Iran system because mm-hmm. it like supplies many more organs to people who need them but it's not a great system and it it leads to sort of organs going to richer people it really concentrates donation among sort of lower classes and people who are desperate for money 
it has like all the problems with of unregulated capitalism that you would expect. And mm -hmm. I'm like not a hardcore enough libertarian to say like you have a right to your body, you should be able to sell it person to person if, mm -hmm. if you want to. I think the sort of opportunities, I don't think kidneys should be allocated based on ability to pay, I guess is one way to put it. But even with it, it with the um, system where the government is compensating you, right, there's obviously a greater incentive for someone who is financially struggling to take advantage of that. And it's a fully refundable sure. tax credit. So it's, just, it's correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. you get $10,000 a year for five years when you file your taxes if you are certified as having donated your kidney. And so that's a lot of money to a lot mm -hmm. of people. That's not insignificant. I know you mentioned that that's kind of the money amount that, uh, you know, uh, some researchers have priced the costs of kidney donation too. So it's not actually compensating you if you take into account all of the costs that have to do with kidney donation. But it is very likely, I mean, I know people who donated plasma or donated sure. blood in order to make money. Some people I know who've considered donating their eggs. I know people have donated their sperm in order to make sure. money when they were in a financially risky place. Um, other than the egg donation, I mean, plasma donation is quite painful, but blood and um, and sperm donation is, is <laughs> sure. not that bad yeah. um, and does not come with really any associated risks. So I mean, would you be concerned if this system went into place and you saw a lot of significantly poor people um, choosing to opt into this and, you know, potentially expressing regret after having done so? No. Um, I think one way of phrasing that question is, would I be concerned if the distribution of this tax credit is such that it mostly helps poor people? And no, I would not be concerned if it mostly helps poor people. I think there's like a lot embedded in these fears that. I find kind of disturbing. Mm. So first, let's talk about plasma. So a lot of countries ban compensation for plasma. Uh, the UK does, Australia does. What happens in those places is not that people like freely give plasma and then that is used to, to for these sort of therapeutic purposes that plasma is used for. What happens is they import plasma from the US and Germany, which actually do pay people for plasma because there is no way to meet market demand for plasma without compensating people. And so, A, there's a degree of hypocrisy. Like, yes, you can ban it, but then you will just, like, shift this market somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But also, like, if you interview people who are selling plasma, they're not in a great place. Mm -hmm. But would they be better off if they didn't have this option? It, would they be better off, like, not being able to pay their bills because they did not have this sort of form of compensation in their lives? I don't but just to steal my this, like obviously you believe in certain kinds of workplace protections. Of that, course, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, I was, exactly. Do you agree with the idea that you would not allow like any sort of labor to exist insofar as it helps poor people? You know, sure, sure. There get is more money. There is some minimum, but yeah. like a thing that is non non lethal and not a long term significant health risk, mm -hmm. and that like provides money to poor people on a reliable basis and serves a like vital health need does not strike me as a particularly hard case. Yeah. Um, so I think that the plasma case is like, the evidence is just overwhelming that we, we need to be compensating people for plasma. And um, and there's no other viable method. And and I think if you like do ethnographies of uh, and talk to people involved in these markets, they are grateful that the market exists. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the kidney thing, like part of what gets me about this is because I have donated I don't have this, like, mystical idea that it's the ultimate violation to, mm. like, lose your kidney. Since, like, that's the motivation here, right? Is mm -hmm. this, like, kind of body horror idea of, of... But also, like, there's significant pain, as you mentioned. I mean, you write about this yourself. Sure. Like, there's significant pain in the aftermath. You talk about this in your own article about how it's hard to walk around. That, that, that obviously, some of the studies have, have difficulty as well quantifying um, the sorts of complications that are not going to rise to going to your doctor, whether it's abdominal pain or sure. it's uh, uh, other kind of gastro issues people might face. I mean, there's things that are, like, harmful right. that cause you... But, like, you yeah. eat strawberries... <laughs> I don't know where that's going. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, have you ever gone picking strawberries? Uh, have you yes. ever, like, tried to fill a whole thing of straw? It's, like, horrible back bait. Like, that yeah. is so much worse than my week after kidney surgery. Like, mm -hmm. like the times I have tried to, like, pick fruit from the ground. So, like, farm working, you're saying we allow that. We, like, yeah. allow—we depend on it. We don't yeah. just allow it. It's, mm -hmm. like, the, the basis for our entire civilization. We allow firefighters. We allow loggers. We mm -hmm. allow uh, fishermen. We allow, like, small plane pilots. The death rates for small plane pilots are crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, death rates for roofers are crazy, um, way higher than anything like remotely close to kidney donation. Mm -hmm. um, so I am I sympathetic to the idea that like, yeah, some people are going to endure some level of pain 
and then get fifty thousand dollars. Do I recoil in horror from that? No. Mm-hmm. Um, it's life. Life is full of trade offs, um, mm-hmm. and I think in some ways I find it more offensive to ask to rely on people donating without any compensation, enduring that pain, and not getting anything in return. That's exploitation. And, I mean, so obviously there's um, not—you are opposed, as you mentioned, to the Iran system of of just allowing people to sell their kidneys. In that system, 76 percent of individuals donating a kidney are impoverished, and it's also a system—obviously, it's a very different country than the United States, where um, Iran is routinely imprisoning debtors, and so there's a huge incentive to make that up. Um, Even in that system, there's a survey that I'm dubious on the methodological (laughs) quality of. They have 100 people they survey in this study, and they find that 76 percent think that um, kidney sales should be banned, and that they—if there's another chance, they would prefer to have begged 40 percent of people say that, or obtain a loan a loan. um, um, 60% of people say that. So I guess, like, would you be surprised if there were high rates of regret in a system where, uh, you know, in the United States, you have these, uh, uh, this the End Kidney Deaths Act passes, and you have significantly more um, low-income people choosing to opt into it. Would you be surprised by regret rates being pretty high? Um, I think I would probably be somewhat surprised because, again, we are nothing like Iran in yeah. many important ways. We have much better post-op mm-hmm. treatment. I would imagine that that outcomes for living donors in, in terms of health are much better. They've been pretty good in, in Iran in most of the literature. Mm-hmm. But um, so I'd be surprised if it looks exactly like that. Will I expect there to be some regret? Sure. I think like it's an insane standard to say that like no one can regret having done this at yeah. all at, yeah. the, at the end of it. Um, it's a it's human life. People mm-hmm. are going to regret some of the decisions they made. Um, you have to look at it as a system as opposed to as sort of a collection of anecdota. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the result, if you enacted this policy, is I think the number of non-directed donors would go from 400 to easily in the thousands, maybe in the tens of thousands every year. This is a population, by the way, that is disproportionately economically disadvantaged. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Rates of kidney failure are much higher among black Americans. Um, it is like negatively socioeconomically associated in part because it's connected to things like obesity and type mm-hmm. 2 diabetes. So tens of thousands of those people will have their lives saved. And in exchange, a large population of people that might be disproportionately low income will get very significant grants of money from the federal government and amounts that could change their lives. Do I think some of them at the end will be like, yeah, I wish I hadn't done that? Sure. Mm-hmm. Do I think that like bears really on, on whether this is a good system? No. I think the question is, how much does it raise transplant rates? Mm-hmm. Does it get to a point where the market clears and, and everyone who needs a kidney gets one? Do people get the money in a, in a prompt way? And does this crowd out other kinds of donation would be my main concern. Mm. Um, Wait, talk to us about that. What do you mean crowding out other types of donation? So, and I want to be careful here because like living donation is so much better than deceased donation that mm-hmm. in in the limit, if you had enough living donors to cover everybody, we just like shouldn't have deceased donation of kidneys at all. Mm-hmm. But before we hit that limit, you could imagine it reducing pressure on organ procurement organizations which collect uh, organs from deceased people mm. to collect if they feel like there's this other market. So this is something that happened in Iran is that there seemed to be some downward pressure on deceased donation as a result of a legal market and living donation. I don't know how much that would happen in the U.S., I think it's, like, worth keeping an eye on. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I um, – you kind of mentioned this a couple of times, but that there's no other way to resolve this shortage other than making it possible to compensate kidney donation. I, mean, I, I want to, like, talk about why sure. that is, like, why there aren't other policy tools. You know, one thing that's been suggested is having an opt-out system at death for organ donation, right? So instead of right now, you know, the DMV and they ask you, like, hey, you need an organ donor and they put a little heart in your uh, – sure. at least on DC ones. I don't know if everyone gets that little heart. But, you know, you get a heart on that. On that, Obviously, you've said that, like, it's not as good, but why wouldn't an opt-out system give us, like, tons more kidneys available to, to be um, used for this purpose? Sure. So, for one thing, like, 
there's been a lot of research on on opt out and opt in systems. Um, the the best study I've seen on this found no effect. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't seem to work or increase a deceased donor donation at all. Um, How could that be? What would that? What, what's happening? Well, what's happening is that uh, when someone dies, what happens is that the doctor asks their family what they want to happen to the organs. Yeah. <laughs> um, that the the only circumstance in which like what it says on your card is relevant is where like a member of your family is not there and cannot be accessed. Mm-hmm. And people have done studies to try to figure out sort of what share of deaths are like that or like you alone there's no family members they have to go by what's on the card and it's maybe five percent of deaths so like it would be crazy if it could have an effect (laughs) Um, uh, it's one of those things that like sounds really fun and nudgy Mm -hmm. um, and like one neat little trick (laughs) to increase uh, access to organs it does not seem to do much of anything Mm -hmm. more broadly not enough people die in ways that are compatible with with organ donation to mm-hmm. make up our need for kidneys. So we need about like ninety three thousand kidneys a year in the U.S. Given like current rates of of kidney failure, and I think about thirty thousand people die a year in ways that are compatible with deceased donor donation. So thirty thousand people. That's sixty thousand kidneys. If you got every single one of those. You're like two-thirds of the way there, but you still have tens of thousands of people dying unnecessarily because they don't have access to kidneys. Mm -hmm. For the record, we're like nowhere near the limit there. Mm -hmm. Um, We have about 15,000 dead people being used uh, for organ donation in uh, 2022, about 20,000 kidneys since a bunch of them died and like had other organs taken but not kidneys for whatever reason. So... Uh, 20,000, maybe you can get that to 60,000 in the limit by uh, encouraging more people, more families to accept uh, donation by trying to increase the take up by these organ procurement organizations that are in charge of that stage of things. Mm -hmm. And that's all good stuff. It's just like not going to get you there. Like it doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. Uh, You need living donation. And again, living organs like last longer and uh, make you healthier than deceased donor organs, which makes sense. Yeah. So I find a lot of what you said very compelling. That's part of why I invited the show. But why do you think that basically no countries have pursued this policy path? If all these arguments are, are so compelling, what has kind of been restraining that policy change? So I think some of it is that... I think it's easy to forget just, like, how new a technology transplantation is. Mm. Um, So the first successful organ transplant was a kidney transplant between identical twins in the 1950s. Like, my mom was alive then. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, we're not talking ancient history. For a couple decades after that, uh, you had really high rejection rates until we got sort of modern immunosuppressant drugs that meant that recipients could sort of reliably get organs and have them take. So... In 1984, which is when the the U.S. first sort of regulated uh, organ transplants, it was still a new technology. It's it's kind of like Congress regulating AI now. Mm -hmm. Um, It was like a very cutting-edge thing that young Congressman Al Gore decided he wanted to, like, cut his teeth on writing legislation about. Mm -hmm. And, And so I think some of the lack of variability is due to that, that we've had 40 years. Mm -hmm. And 40 years is not a lot of time. And... Countries are relatively, like, small-c conservative. They don't like to be outliers on certain policies. And there's been a lot of consensus among bioethicists and and physicians against doing this. I I blame the late British sociologist Richard Titmuss a lot for this. (laughs) Say more? He, uh... He wrote a book called The Gift Relationship, where his, like, central argument was that when Britain sort of experimented with pain for blood donation, they got Mm -hmm. less, fewer blood donors than when it was purely voluntary. And so that it wouldn't work to compensate people and it would crowd out altruism if you compensated people for blood. And people Mm -hmm. like drew the analogy from that to kidneys. And A, subsequent research shows that's not true at all for blood. Mm -hmm. Um, And B, where it is true, it's like maybe true at very small amounts of compensation. Like maybe if you would, would donate blood for free, but they offer you, like, a dollar, you won't do it because, like, that's weird. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're talking about $50,000. Yeah. Um, But it was very influential among sort of a certain class of physicians who wound up making international policy and sort of having conferences to discuss this and and coming to uh, a kind of consensus around it. It's funny. I, when I first um, started looking into this, I kind of assumed that the dominant position that people had was that they would be kind of 
offended at the idea of organ sales um, or compensating people for their kidneys. There is one really good study published in the American Economic Review in 2019 where they look at over 2,600 U.S. residents and find that across a variety of condition of conditions, an average of 57% of respondents supported a paid donor system, and 70% did it if the system was, quote, assumed to satisfy 100% of demand. Was that surprising to you when you first heard it? It was, but I think as I followed this more and gotten more into it, it became less surprising. But I think, like, if you're in kidney world, compensation is, like, the big dividing issue. Mm -hmm. Um, And sort of the old state institutions uh, are very skeptical of it because it seems radical and scary. And it's, yeah, it's just, like, a big flashpoint. If you haven't heard, like, if you're an alien dropped into this, which Mm -hmm. I think is a reasonable proxy for where most Americans are, the idea of, like, hey, this person who does a hard thing, like, should they be paid for it? Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound crazy at all. It sounds completely reasonable, especially when you, like, lay out the consequences, which that study does, um, that if it didn't change donation rates at all, I think I would still be in favor because I think it's important to compensate people for their work, but Mm -hmm. I would be much less strongly in favor. Mm -hmm. Um, The case overwhelmingly rests on the belief that this would clear the waiting list and get people kidneys to save their lives. But would this clear the waiting list? Because, I mean, $50,000, you said, is is the amount to which, you know, people are being compensated for their pain. But I would imagine a lot of people would expect on top of that. Like, I don't just go to work to sure. compensate me for the pain of going to work. I want more money <laughs> than right. that. So no one knows what, what the, the right price is to clear the waiting list, in part because uh, outside of Iran, no one, no one really has a market on this. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to get accurate price discovery unless you have a real market. Mm-hmm. And... I think the best study I've seen on this suggested the market would clear at like $77,000 a year mm-hmm. uh, in McCormick at all 2022. But they have a very wide error band. What I feel very confident saying is that $50,000 from the current baseline would dramatically increase donation. Mm-hmm. Like I, I find it hard to imagine that that would not be true. It might not increase it to the point where we have all the organs we need, mm-hmm. but I think it will very substantially increase it. And if you're skeptical of that, I would say that that is one reason to support this bill, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that we don't have a lot of evidence about this. And it could be that I am wildly wrong and I will gladly concede defeat if we do it and and donation rates don't increase at all. But we won't know if we don't try. And um, you've reported on this bill. So, I mean, you have any updates on whether or not it's likely to pass? So it's up in the air. I, I think it has a lot, pretty widespread bipartisan support. They've been trying to do, this is called a Noah's Ark approach to like co-sponsorship where you add one Democrat for one Republican. And mm-hmm. so I think they're up to like eight or 10. And I've been impressed by sort of how bipartisan it is, how um, that it, I think it uh, is likely to save the government money because the government pays for a lot of dialysis and dialysis is extremely expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so anything you can do to increase transplantation probably saves the government money, even if you're paying donors a significant amount. I think the difficulty is some of these sort of like more conventional organizations in the kidney world that are skeptical of, of taking a step of this magnitude. Um, and if I wanted to be cynical, I could say that the the people with the most money in kidney world are dialysis companies, which lose money whenever people get kidney transplants and so have an active interest in trying to reduce the number of transplants. Mm. Um, if I wanted to be less cynical, I could say it is a significant policy change and, and people uh, are, are understandably uh, hesitant to change the paradigm. But it's just very obvious to me that the current situation isn't working. I think that's obvious to a lot of people in Congress, and I think there's there's appetite for something different. Well, Dylan, this has been a lot to think about and always our last question on the show, sure. which I hope for many people, um, they would answer it by saying they now feel that kidney donation <laughs> is safe. But for you, what's an idea that you had um, that seemed good at first but ended up being only good on paper? So this is probably not going to uh, – if people have listened this far and think, like, Dylan's a crazy person who wants to let people get money for organs, this is not going <laughs> to disabuse them of their impression of me. Years ago, I got really into this uh, research literature finding that places that sort of naturally due to rock composition have more lithium in the water supply, just like trace amounts of lithium, okay. also had lower suicide rates. Oh, because lithium is a it's it's, it's a, a treatment, treatment for, for depression, right? Specifically, it's a treatment for bipolar, for bipolar and, okay. and uh, schizophrenia. But uh, yeah, so it had like a causal mechanism that made sense. 
Um, it was very, very small amounts, and there didn't seem to be negative side effects from this. Mm -hmm. And it felt kind of like putting fluoride in the water of, mm -hmm. like, maybe this mm -hmm. is just a nice... There was a really big study in Denmark that was doing sort of like really good like matching controls and tracking people over time uh, that found a null effect. And yeah. so that was a place where it just like, oh, this seems interesting and like maybe a really cheap intervention that could save mm -hmm. people's lives. Uh, and then smart people looked into it. and I was like, yeah, oh, OK. <laughs> OK, so we're not putting lithium in the in the uh, water. See, I'm not totally unreasonable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Dylan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Good on Paper is produced by Janae West. It was edited by Dave Shaw, fact-checked by Anna Alvarado, and engineered by Erica Huang. Our theme music is composed by Rob Smirciak. Claudine Abade is the executive producer of Atlantic Audio, and Andrea Valdez is our managing editor. And hey, if you like what you're hearing, please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Jerusalem Demsis, and we'll see you next week.